Good evening, everybody. I'm glad to be back. Glad that you're all back for this third uh, lecture of the session. Uh, today, we're going to have a, a colleague and a friend of mine, Dr. Salvatore Spina, who's going to talk to us about a little bit about other diseases of the brain, other neurodegenerative diseases of the brain beyond Alzheimer's disease that can produce, that can lead to dementia, and what do those clinical syndromes look like? Uh, just to briefly review what we've touched on uh, on the previous two lectures, we've talked about sort of an overview of the neurodegenerative diseases, how uh, different disease processes that are happening in the, in the brain can lead to very different, dr dramatically different clinical manifestations. Um, and through Alzheimer's disease, that was our previous lecture, we also learned that the same disease process of the brain, depending on how it affects the brain, can lead to very different clinical manifestations, right? The different variants of Alzheimer's disease. So today we're going to expand on that theme um, and talk about different diseases uh, beyond Alzheimer's. And, and, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Spina, is going to show you uh, what these diseases look like in life. And we're going to take it from there. So without further ado, here's Dr. Spina. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm very excited about being here uh, tonight to talk to you about these diseases uh, um, uh, and you know, the problems that they, that they raise for patients and also for uh, their families and how as neurologists we try to uh, sort them out, we try to understand uh, them and differentiate them one from the other. So, uh, in terms of disclosure, I received research support from the uh, NIH and from other uh, private uh, foundations, but I have no conflicts related to this presentation. A brief overview of uh, the things we're going to talk tonight. So, we're going to discuss the prevalence, so how common are these diseases in the general population, and we're going to compare the prevalence of different diseases to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then we're going to talk about the most common ones. So the focus will be on the neurodegenerative ones, so the ones that are caused by progressive loss of neurons um, in the brain. And uh, uh, the one that we will touch base on the uh, Lewy body disease, is Lewy body disease, which is an alpha-synucleinopathy. So this is a group of disorders characterized by the deposition of a protein called uh, alpha-synuclein. There's two of them. There's actually three of them, but two of them, Parkinson disease and dementia with Lewy bodies cause dementia. There's a third synucleopathy it's called multiple system atrophy. Uh, it's a disease that rarely causes dementia, but it, it can to about very rarely, less than 5% of people. Then we're going to talk about the frontotemporal lobar degenerations. Um, we talk about a new topic, a relatively new topic, a neurodegeneration of aging. Uh, I say relatively new because it's actually we're talking about it for now for decades, but it gets a little bit better formalized really just a few days ago. So this is really breakthrough uh, information. And then uh, we'll discuss about, so what is the cause of really dementia? Is it uh, one disease for every person different than, than another person, or there's more than one uh, um, change that occurring in the brain, so more than one diseases at microscopic level uh, that actually uh, um, co-work together, cooperate together to cause dementia, to, to cause the symptoms. Finally, we'll talk briefly about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is one of the latest uh, pathological diagnoses. And uh, um, it is related, as you know, as you probably, many of you know, to trauma. And it's a, a main concern, it's a, becoming a main concern among uh, patients coming to clinic with a history of head trauma. So we'll talk about how this is relevant for the general population. So uh, you all have been exposed to the numbers of the Alzheimer's disease epidemic. So you have heard this very large number of, uh, in terms of problems, a number, large number of patients affected, what this means for the society. Um, and so the, um, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in the general population right now uh, is about almost 2,000 every 100,000 people. So, uh, uh, 1,800 people for 100,000. This is basically what our estimate is based on the estimate of the number of people f uh, that are um, that have been diagnosed with this disease. So about 5.8 million, for instance, in the United States. This prevalence is probably an underestimate, as you know, because a lot of people do not actually get diagnosed, never receive a formal diagnosis, never see a clinician. So while the total prevalence is this large number, so 1,800, uh, the prevalence is actually different when we look at this throughout the uh, um, 
of the lifespan. So uh, if you look at only people who are less than 65 year old, there's actually only 72 people out of 100,000 with Alzheimer's disease. Then the number tends to go up. 65 to 74 is about 300. The largest number of patients with Alzheimer's disease are uh, in age group 75 to 84. And then the number of, of uh, uh, people affected with Alzheimer's disease actually uh, start declining, and declining for two reasons. First of all, there's less people, of course, that survive uh, past age 85. The, the uh, expectancy in our country is around that, that uh, number. But then there's also the uh, uh, occurrence of other diseases, the diseases of aging, that can also play uh, a role and so lead to dementia, uh, even in the absence of Alzheimer's disease changes. So we will start with this image, and then I'll tell you uh, why it could be wrong. <laughs> but, so if we have to uh, assign a single disease, so a, a single change that occurs in the brain uh, to the cause of dementia, so in, in a patient, then uh, we think that about two-thirds of all patients with dementia will have Alzheimer's disease. So that makes Alzheimer's disease the most common form of dementia. In about a quarter of patients with dementia, we actually don't find the neurodegenerative changes. And uh, we think that vascular changes, so vascular changes are basically small infarts of the brain occurring throughout life. They may be responsive to some degree of cognitive decline that we see through life, that at some point may turn into, uh, into dementia. Lewy body disease, which is the second most common form of neurodegenerative disease, is actually uh, attributed a number that is less than 10%. So one in 10 patients that comes to clinic with a diagnosis of dementia will be diagnosed with Lewy body disease as a primary uh, disorder. The frontotemporal dementias are relatively rare. There's always been uh, defined as rare, but we'll see that that definition really depends on what is the age uh, of the population that we are uh, talking about. So if we think about the larger general population, then the numbers, the figures are indeed small, perhaps 3%. Frontotemporal dementia is also a condition that is largely unrecognized by, by the clinician. And so a lot of patients with, a, with this form of disease may actually be misdiagnosed with having other forms of diseases with Alzheimer's disease this has been the, the number one. But we will see that in other uh, uh, age range, frontotemporal dementia become instead an important cause of dementia. Finally, there are uh, other diseases that are rarer that may be responsible for, uh, for uh, small proportions of cases. So we'll start with Lewy body disease. Again, this is a single entity pathologically because essentially it's caused by the uh, deposition of alpha-synuclein in, uh, in the brain. And the two major diseases are Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy body. So we want to be careful in this distinction of you know, uh, Lewy body disease versus dementia with Lewy body. It's essentially not two ways of saying the same thing. So Lewy body disease is what happened in the brain, and the consequence of Lewy body disease can be either Parkinson or dementia with Lewy bodies. So the most common of these diseases is Parkinson's disease. This is a condition that is relatively well known by the, by the general population. Uh, it's a disease that is characterized by very uh, easy to, to recognize uh, symptoms and, and signs. You might have heard about resting tremors, so a tremor that kicks in while the patient is not actually doing any movement. It actually may improve when the patient is moving. For instance, they reappear once that movement is stopped. Patient tends to become very rigid, very stiff. Usually the stiffness is asymmetric, meaning one side of the body is more stiff than the other. This is important for the clinician because it's more likely to be caused by Parkinson's disease than by other diseases that look like Parkinson's, but they're not. Uh, the patient with Parkinson's and bradykinesia, this is a term that essentially means slow movement. So slow movement is one of the most cardinal features of Parkinson's. Everything is slowed down, and it's not just movement. It could be also walking, but it could be turning, for instance. It's also thinking. So the slow thinking of the bradyphrenia is also a characteristic feature of, uh, of, of Parkinson's. There is postural instability that usually leads uh, people with Parkinson to fall, to be prone to, to falling. And then again, this asymmetric onset, so a patient that has one side of the body, either the left or the right, more affected than the other, is very indicative of this condition. And the most indicative feature clinically is probably the responsiveness to levodopa. So levodopa is a medication that can be given to patients with Parkinson's disease. Patients who have a true Parkinson usually tends to have a very good response to this, to this drug that lasts for several years. 
and it can uh, improve dramatically their symptoms. When this response is not there, then is when we start uh, uh, um, uh, being concerned that this is probably not Parkinson's disease, but another con instead another condition. The prevalence of Parkinson is very high. So in, in people who are uh, in the fifth decade of life, there's about 40 individuals out of 100,000 who already developed this condition. And then in people who are actually very old, their prevalence is definitely very high, 1900, so probably even higher than Alzheimer's disease. Uh, again, Parkinson's disease in elderly is also often unrecognized. Sometimes patients, people become just a little bit slower. They start uh, uh, developing a shuffling type of, uh, of gait. Their balance tends to get uh, worsened. Very often, uh, this is attributed to vascular disease, but actually neuropathological studies have shown that this is Parkinson's disease just showing up very late in life. And then another thing that is not, clear, that is not very uh, uh, often told about is that Parkinson's disease is not just a movement disorder, but 30 to 40% of patients with Parkinson's disease will develop dementia toward their life. And the risk of developing dementia is higher as long as the patient sleeps. So, so, uh, so increase basically with aging. A uh, patient with Parkinson's can live many years, and essentially people that will survive this diagnosis for more than 20 years have more than 80% of chances, perhaps according to other groups, even up to 100% of chances of developing dementia. So uh, why is dementia with Lewy bodies different than Parkinson's? So the distinction is really based, as Dr. Lanada was saying before, on what part of the brain is affected first by the disease. So traditionally, in Parkinson's disease is the most caudal, so the lower part of the brain, the one that is attached to the spinal cord, that is affected first by the disease. And then the disease from this portion of the brain uh, start moving toward the cortex, so the brain itself. And so from movement changes, um, we are the, the onset of cognitive changes. In dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, the disease instead has a very high burden of pathology already in the cortex since the very beginning. That explains why cognitive changes come very early. Usually this distinction is considered technically, at least in the research setting, to be a year. So if patients is cognitively normal for the first year of movement symptoms, um, we'll be given a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. If instead the cognitive changes occur during the first year, is sometimes prior to the movement changes, then it will be given a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. The distinction is important for many reasons, to know what can happen later, and also because the management of patients with these two different conditions is actually different, meaning we use different medications, and we have to be more cautious with the use of one of other medications according to what is the correct diagnosis. To give you a sense of what a patient with dementia will be body disease experience, um, there is usually uh, complaints about attention, a deficit of attention, a deficit with uh, uh, task execution, there's also profound visual spatial deficits, so the patient have difficulties with moving in the space, they get disoriented, but also have difficulties with uh, understanding spatial relationship. There is uh, the presence of characteristic cognitive fluctuations. These are like dramatic changes in the level of cognitive functioning of the, of the patients that can occur even within a day or from a day to another. So the patients may look very uh, somnolent, inattentive, unable to follow a conversation early in the morning, and then all of a sudden look much more bright and much more attentive a few hours later. And then they can go back to this um, status of hypersomnia, uh, uh, confusion, uh, inattentiveness. Visual hallucinations are very common, and probably one of the symptoms that uh, clinicians pick up very soon as indicative of this condition. Visual hallucinations in dementia with Lewy bodies, but also in Parkinson, are uh, typical. Patients experience the presence uh, of, uh, of somebody, of, of a person, or, or shadows, for instance, in the room, very often behind their, their head, what we call extra camping hallucination. Meaning these images, these things that are not there, but they're perceived as real, are often somewhat outside of the visual field. They cannot be, they cannot be followed. So the patient will turn their head, looking at the shadow behind, and they will be gone already, even before he can realize that there was somebody or not. Sometimes the hallucinations involve uh, seeing people, sometimes involve uh, seeing uh, uh, faces or, or, or little animals. They may be more or less complex. Some of them are perceived as frightening. Some others are instead are perceived as non-real and, uh, and some, sometimes even somewhat peaceful. Some of these patients report, for instance, seeing deceased um, uh, relatives uh, as a result of, of these hallucinations.
but sometimes they may be very, very bothering and difficult to, to treat. Both conditions share a, uh, a phenomenon that's called the REM sleep behavior disorder. This is essentially another way of talking about the dream enactment. So when we are in this particular phase of sleep, REM, the one where we have rapid high movements that can be seen underneath uh, uh, the eyelids, we usually dream. And so uh, evolutionistically, uh, we have a system that basically makes us completely paralyzed. So the, the muscle tone is completely uh, eliminated. So that we cannot move, we cannot follow our dream, and we are prevented from the danger that that can, uh, can trigger. So patients who do have uh, dream anatomy and are at risk for alpha-synucleinopathy, almost all of them, and this is a very typical in patients with body disease, but it can also be a risk factor for, for Parkinson's disease. Eventually, this, the motor signs of Parkinson's disease develop in all patients with uh, uh, dementia with be bodies, but tends to be less typical. So these patients usually have less tremor, but appear a lot more rigid, for instance. Um, so uh, in, in the prevalence, as I said before, is about uh, 7%. There are other symptoms that we uh, think are characteristic or at least indicative of this class of diseases, the alpha-synucleinopathy. So the autonomic nervous system, which is the part of the nervous system that controls all the activities that we don't have to think about. So how to keep the blood pressure high all the time, regardless of whether we are laying down on bed or standing, or how do we keep our, our body temperature constant, regardless of what's the temperature outside. So all of these functions are done without us thinking, but this part of the nervous system is heavily affected by uh, the, the deposition of alpha synucleinopathy. There is usually a referred degree sense of smell, which, however, is shared by other conditions. So it's not only specific of, of this disorder. Seborrheic dermatitis, which is a, an, an inflammatory condition of the skin, usually a, a, is a response to a increased secretion of sebus, um, is a risk factor for the alpha-synucleinopathy. So there is a higher uh, incidence of, uh, of this disorder in people who also have seborrheic dermatitis. And then often patients with alpha synucleinopathy uh, suffer of a severe anxiety, depression, um, and then we know about the diminished tone of voice, the decreased facial uh, expression, and very often also of delusional thinking. So these delusions may be of all sorts, um, paranoid delusions, for instance, or also of other type. So this scheme, this scheme uh, again, sh uh, show you uh, what I was mentioning in terms of, you know, the, the disease look like based on uh, what parts of the brain is involved. And uh, usually in classic Parkinson's disease, you know, the, the medulla is the first part of the brain that is affected. So this is a, cen a center of autonomic uh, um, uh, regulations. And then progressively, the disease starts uh, um, involving more rostral portion of the brain. There are centers here that control the mood, for instance, so the anxiety, the depression at this point kicks in. And then when uh, structures like the midbrain are involved, that is when the bradykinesia, so the slow movement, uh, the rigidity eventually is manifested. Eventually, the disease spread all the way throughout, giving rise also to the cognitive symptoms and the, and the dementia. So again, in, in dementia with Lewy bodies, this phase is actually seen earlier in the disease process, and the disease may start more in the in a central portion of the brain and actually spread in both directions, both versus cortical area, and also eventually more caudally, so giving rise to the motor symptoms actually later. So this slide just uh, match basically the different stage in, in the manifestation of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, as really a consecutive involvement of different regions of the brain, as I've shown you before. And then from the point of view of the neuropathologist, this is a section of the midbrain, so the part of the brain that really connect the brainstem with the brain, with itself, with the cerebral hemispheres. And the structure here that you see is called the substantia nigra, which basically means the black substance. It's an area of the brain that is enriched with neurons that produce dopamine, and there go also the, the color, the black color, which is like a byproduct of the synthesis of this molecule. So uh, the loss of these neurons, the, the, the neuronal uh, death caused by Parkinson's disease will cause the complete disappearance of the substantia nigra. And that is why we also use levodopa as a main drug in order really to replace what is basically being taken away by, by the disease. <laughs> 
We talk about Lewy bodies, how these are Lewy body uh, diseases, and so these are Lewy bodies. So these are Lewy bodies as they look like on a histological staining that we call hematoxylin eosin. It's just a wave, basically, that we can stain the tissue either in red or, or blue color. And uh, uh, a Lewy bodies will look like this round structure. Here there is one, this is another one here, usually surrounded by this large halo. And then if we stain the tissue with antibodies directed against a specific protein, in this case it would be alpha-synuclein, we can see that these structures indeed are made of alpha-synuclein, so confirming that indeed these are Lewy bodies. So this is how the neuropathologist eventually will make this diagnosis on the brain when examining the brain post-mortem. All right, so... Um, we move now to the, uh, to the next group of, uh, uh, of dementia uh, in terms of uh, incidence. So we're going to talk about the frontotemporal lobar degeneration. This is a very interesting group of, uh, of disorders. And you can see that the name essentially is already saying what is the most cardinal features of them. So it's really the involvement, uh, the preferential involvement of the frontal in the temporal lobes of the brain. I'll give you here a picture of the uh, brain, the brain postmortem. So this is the frontal lobe of the brain. This is the temporal lobe. And then you have the posterior regions of the brain, the parietal portion of the brain, and the occipital lobe all the way here posterior. So you, you can see that there is a striking difference in how, uh, on, on the extent of shrinkage, really, technically, of, uh, of the brain tissue in the frontal portion and the anterior portion of the temporal lobe. You see that it's opening up a little bit. You can even see more deeper structure here. What this normal would appear would not uh, occur, while the posterior regions of the brains are uh, better preserved. So this is a strange disease that, uh, even though causes dementia, doesn't affect the brain as a whole, but affect preferentially this anterior portion of the brain as opposed to the posterior ones. So these are very old diseases, and the first description of this very peculiar way of causing dementia was given by Arnold Peake back in 1892. So Peake was a, a neuropathologist working with, uh, with, with Alzheimer, and um, it basically show, uh, identified this very peculiar uh, set of cases in which the brain just didn't look like an Alzheimer one. So there was not in atrophy, so a, a reduction in the volume of all regions, but the, these two regions, the frontal and the temporal lobe, were selectively involved, while the rest of the brain was looking pretty much uh, unaffected. It was actually Alzheimer's disease that defined the term PIC disease, and uh, he did it because uh, when he examined the first cases of this brain, um, uh, observed that there were not neuritic plaques, and you have heard about neuritic plaques from the talk from Dr. Nassan, so they were not the classic features of Alzheimer's disease, so these were indeed not cases of Alzheimer. And instead, there were this very rounded and silver-stained uh, um, structures that he called uh, peak bodies in honor of Arnold Peake, who actually had, had found the disease. So the term peak bodies is actually uh, created by uh, Alzheimer, and the name peak disease is also um, uh, picked by, uh, by Alzheimer disease. I have to say that even nowadays, so. Uh, many years later, the term peak disease is used as a, a synonym of frontotemporal dementia. Um, so in, for the clinical presentation, and also as a, a synonym of frontotemporal lobar degeneration, which is the process that happens in the brain of people with this type of disease. But this term is actually, this association is actually improper. So we will see in the next slide the PIC disease is only one type, uh, and not even the most common type of the frontotemporal lobar degeneration. So although many clinicians still use, and in general, uh, term, this term is still used as a synonym of frontotemporal dementia, the two things are actually, are actually distant. So how often is frontotemporal dementia? So the proportion of cases is actually very low. So compared to 1,800 for 100,000 cases of Alzheimer's disease, on the same population of 100,000, there's probably no more than 50 cases of FTD. Again, this number may be uh, strongly underestimating the real prevalence. This disease is difficult to uh, diagnose sometimes, and the clinicians are less exposed or even less educated in, uh, in, in training. Uh, so the number may be a little bit higher, but definitely uh, the proportion is much smaller than that of Alzheimer's disease. However, if we look at uh, the uh, uh, different age ranges, then the scenario changed dramatically. So 
By age 65, frontotemporal dementia is actually as common as Alzheimer's disease. So if somebody has cognitive changes, behavioral changes, and presents to, uh, to a memory clinic and is 65 years old, it actually has a one-to-one -one chances of having either Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia. It things get even worse if we think about even younger stages. So in people who are less than 60 years old, uh, we think nowadays that frontotemporal lobe degeneration is actually more common than Alzheimer's disease as causes of dementia. Does it exist in the elderly? It does, but it's uh, not so common, and perhaps the prevalence will be around 3%. So we're gonna talk first about the syndrome. So you remember the distinction that Dr. Lanada uh, uh, presented since uh, lecture number one. One thing are the syndrome, so the symptoms, the reason the patients come to the clinic. Another thing is finding out what's happening in the brain. So let's look first at the syndromes. So under the umbrella of frontotemporal dementia, which is the clinical presentation of people with frontotemporal lobe degeneration, there are at least uh, uh, three canonical uh, syndromes. One is called behavioral variant, frontotemporal dementia, because of the predominant behavioral aspects of the clinical presentation, which are actually much more severe than the cognitive ones. So patient behavior is much more affected, for instance, than, than memory or other, or other cognitive functions. And then there are two variants that affect instead language. So we call them the language variants of frontotemporal dementia. One is called semantic variant, and the other one is called non-fluent variant. And once again, from the temporal lobe degeneration, it gives us again a confirmation of that on the fact that this really where the disease is mostly causing damage of the brain that will lead the clinical presentation. So uh, in patients who have profound atrophy of the uh, insula, the cingulate gyrus, the, the prefrontal cortex, the clinical presentation will be that of behavioral variant FTD. In patients who have anterior temporal lobe degeneration, the clinical presentation will be that a semantic variant, um, PPA. And in patients who have a predominant degeneration of uh, the uh, structures that are related to language, mostly language production, uh, the clinical presentation will be that a non-fluent variant, frontotemporal dementia. So I'm gonna tell you first about the behavioral variant FTD. So these are patients who manifest very early in their disease uh, course some very uh, um, uh, prototypical uh, symptoms. In order to make a diagnosis, you need at least three of the, of the first six uh, uh, um, criteria. So patients present often with profound disinhibition. This means uh, uh, profoundly inappropriate behavior, which usually translates into being totally unable or no longer basically able to comply with standard uh, rules of social conduct. They otherwise may present with profound apathy or inertia. That means that they will be uh, losing interest. They will be losing any initiative on doing things. This can be people who are very socially engaged, very active, very productive, uh, and then all of a sudden start seeing all of their interest completely fading away. So what, what before was very important, getting up in the morning, going to work, paying bills, uh, interacting with the family, all of a sudden become not interested, absolutely not necessary. Um, together with this, there is the development of changes in emotion regulation. Uh, this goes on both sides. There is a progressive difficulty in understanding other people's emotions, so an absolute inability to understand people's uh, uh, sadness or happiness or anger or frustration. Uh, this is also uh, associated with an uh, inability to understand or to act uh, in a way that is compliant to the proper emotions, so to inner emotions. So patients, for instance, will no longer feel embarrassment uh, or no longer feel sadness um, themselves. There is often the uh, um, insurgence of new behavior that tends to be very perseverative, meaning they happen all the time, it's like a compulsion type of behavior. It's very difficult to manage, and they ended up uh, uh, um, uh, using basically the largest amount of time of this patient during, the, during their daily life. So again, they no longer do any work, for instance, they no longer interact with the family, but they may be a very uh, interesting to you know, a new collections, for instance, of, of item or, uh, or other type of activities. Some of them may actually be interesting, like for instance, the development of new artistic abilities. But often the, the activities are actually totally futile and don't, don't lead to anything that is, uh, that is productive. 
There is hyperorality, which basically is an increased interest toward uh, food, especially food that have high calorie or, or sweets. Uh, but there's also a, a, an increased activity of um, uh, placing objects in the mouth. It, re it kind of remember a little bit of the behavior of kids like in the very first uh, year of life. So that is the type of regression that we often see. Patients will stuff their mouth with a, lot of, a large amount of food, for instance, sometimes make it difficult, for instance, to, to swallow, or they would uh, attempt to swallow unedible uh, objects. And then in terms of the cognitive profile, uh, a neuropsychologist uh, is usually faced with patients that can no longer function uh, in the society, in their regular life, but actually tends to perform really well or relatively well on the classic cognitive test that is given to screen patients for Alzheimer's disease, for instance. Their memory remains pretty good for, for a long time. And so they usually tend to do much better on cognitive testing than as compared to actually how they're functioning in, uh, in real life. Beside the, the criteria, you know, we also uh, helped by, again, the imaging studies as, as, uh, in, in the diagnosis, as I've shown you before, and also by genetic that sometimes can make the diagnosis uh, clear and definitive. So why emotion? Why is emotion the central uh, piece of the clinical manifestation? That's because, again, there's areas in the brain like the insular bilaterally in the singular gyros, which are really the structures of the brain that we use in order to understand ethical values, morality, what is good and what is bad, is my action going to harm somebody, did I do something that is inappropriate, so all of this action, what is important now, um, uh, all of this activity of the brain, all of the structures in the brain that are uh, doing this, even when we don't think about it, those are the ones that are affected first and early in this, uh, in this disease. So these are just some examples of emotional deficit, but the list really can be very long. So uh, this patient's big, a loose concern for loved one uh, illness. They sometimes develop a cruel type of, uh, of behavior toward uh, um, children, toward animals, toward elderly. Very often this can result into uh, issues with the law, for instance. Um, there are, they are, tends to be prone to, to rude comments uh, uh, to others. More distinctively, there is this loss of interpersonal space. Again, the entire scheme of the general rule of social conduct that we learn you know, through, through childhood gets somewhat uh, um, um, lost. The disgusting behaviors, as, uh, as described here, is again uh, secondary to the generation of centers in the brain that tell us what is dangerous. So we all know that it's dangerous, for instance, to look for food, uh, I don't know, in, in a trash can. This, this, this immediate stop sign, this red flag, is gone. And so to, this together, uh, unfortunately, with the hyperorality may push uh, patients with, uh, with this type of disorder to, for instance, to look for food everywhere, or to steal food from other people's plates. And there's also some changes in the way the brain also interprets external stimuli, including, uh, including pain. So during this presentation, I will show you a few videos. These are from uh, patients and research participants of our clinic. They have uh, uh, all provided the authorization for the distribution of these videos for uh, uh, educational uh, purposes. So, so this is a gentleman that was very uh, active and very productive in his life and very close to his family, whose behavior uh, changed as a result of behavioral variant FTD. We never go the first Sunday of the month because that's communion. In our communion, you walk down front, and as you walk down the aisle, everyone was greeted and back rubbed and asked where they were from. And it was just very disruptive. Oh, I was born in Africa. Africa. <laughs> So you see, this is a behavior that we would expect, again, on a kid, so, uh, but also motivated and triggered by what we call utilization behavior. So if a stimulus is in front, in this case, it would be like the hair of the person sitting just in front of them. There's almost this magnetic attraction and the complete loss of the social conduct rule, right, that should have uh, uh, impeded that. Here I give an example of the ritualistic behavior, the compulsion developed by uh, this patient. This is where Bob keeps all his possessions, his coins. <laughs> 
and his wallet, and he always has a pen in his book, and then he keeps his figures for his ants, and he records all of them, and keeps them down by the day of the week, and how many he killed, and then these stay here for quite a while, and then he also has all of his napkins that he likes to save, even if they're used or not, and he always has some in his pocket that he keeps, and a little stash of candy. So again, a very meticulous activity that can occupy a large amount of hours, but it is, of course, uh, um, futile. So we move now to the uh, um, language variant of uh, frontotemporal dementia. So again, I told you about semantic variant and non-fluent variant uh, uh, frontotemporal dementia. So what are they? So this concept uh, of primary progressive aphasia was uh, put in place by Marcel Mesulam back in 2001. Marcel Mesulam is one of the most famous uh, behavioral neurologists in the planet. And he was the first one that described uh, beautifully the syndrome, primary progressive aphasia. This is a condition in which uh, language is the main um, area that degenerates uh, for the first couple of years in the disease process of people with degenerative disease. So this is a neuro degenerative diseases. These are not stroke. These are diseases similar to, uh, to Alzheimer's, so caused by progressive loss of neurons and atrophy, so shrinkage of the, of the brain, in which language is predominantly affected and everything else is almost unaffected, at least for the first couple of years. So later, uh, Marilu Gorno-Tempini uh, has actually mapped the three more commonly uh, known forms of primary progressive aphasia. And again, you can see that it's really which part of the brain that is affected that determine what type of primary progressive aphasia patients will have. So the one that relates to frontotemporal dementia are the one in blue, semantic dementia, when the degeneration is mostly in the anterior temporal lobe, right here. And then in green, the non-fluent variant uh, of primary progressive aphasia, in which is the posterior portion of the frontal lobe, but also the insula. Uh, of the brain that, that degenerates. So these are really the two uh, PPA syndromes linked to frontotemporal lobar degeneration. There is a third form of PPA, which is called logopenic variant. You might have heard about it uh, from the talk of Dr. Nassan. So this is one of those focal forms of Alzheimer's disease, so logopenic variant PPA is almost invariably associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. But the other two are actually two forms of frontotemporal lobar degeneration. So in semantic dementia, again, there is a, a profound and early degeneration of the temporal poles. We have two of them, one on the left and, and one on the right. And semantic dementia is essentially caused by the degeneration of the anterior temporal lobe in the language-dominant cerebral hemisphere. So language is a lateralized function in the brain, meaning it's, only, it's predominantly on one side of the, of the brain. And in the majority of us, in the majority of the population, is confined to the left side. So if the left temporal pole undergo neurodegeneration, semantic variant PPA develops. The most striking features of this disease is impaired confrontation naming. So what does it mean, confrontation naming? It means basically showing to somebody a picture or an object and simply asking for the names. So the very first symptoms is the uh, progressive loss of name, of the ability to name things. So this is called anomia, also neurologically, but in this particular condition, semantic dementia is just, it's even more than just the difficulty with the name. It's mostly actually the loss of the word meaning. So when a patient cannot come up with a name, it's not because he knows very well what it is, what that object is, he just cannot retrieve the word. He's actually lost the concept of that specific object or that specific word. And this becomes more severe initially, early in the, the disease process for words that we use less. So things that are more common are the last ones that would disappear. Names that, that we use more commonly will be the last one to disappear. Names or words that we use less frequently will be the first one instead to disappear. <laughs> 
Together with this loss of meaning for words, there's also a loss of meaning for objects. So sometimes patients are presented with an object and they're unable to, uh, to tell what it is or what is the function of that. There is the development of a new symptoms that's called surface dyslexia. So this has uh, little to do with the classic dyslexia that we are used to, uh, um, to, to hear about. And it's instead the phenomenon of uh, uh, enunciation of specific words when these are phonetically irregular. So what is a word that is phonetically, phonetically irregular? It's a word that basically, in order to pronounce it correctly, you need to know how this word sounds. You cannot just rely on the, on the letters on the screen. So this is a word that's pronounced carnal, but you really have to learn that this is carnal and not colonel. So a patient with semantic variant PPA may find himself actually pronouncing these words as colonel as opposed to uh, carnal. And this is actually a syndrome that is more commonly seen in languages that have irregularly, irregular phonetic words. My language, for instance, Italian, is very few of them, almost none. So surface dyslexia is very difficult to, to assess just because every letter is pronounced essentially the same way. English is the perfect language instead to, to assess this type, of, this type of problem. So if uh, this comes in somebody who is in a second, uh, 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 English as second language, you want to be a little bit careful. <laughs> so uh, there is usually spared repetition. So even though the patient may not know what they're saying or what is the meaning of the words, they're actually able to repeat even a very long sentence. So they may not know exactly what's in it, but they can repeat it without mistakes. And usually grammar is also spared. So they don't make, pro they don't make mistakes either when talking or, or when writing. They usually become very verbal. So one of the typical characteristics of patients with semantic dementia is their verbosity. They're hyperverbal. And this is one of the reasons uh, that we call this forms of PPA effluent aphasia. So it's fluent for two reasons. There are not difficulties in the enunciation of words. It's the words meaning that are lost. And secondly, there is also this increased produ production of, uh, of speech that is sometimes a sign. So these are also examples in which we can elicit this disease in, in, the, in clinic. So we can ask patients, for instance, to draw animal. And here we start seeing that you know, a dog is drawn overall in an OK type of fashion. And then we move to a cat. And you know, we can still recognize you know, the structure of an animal you know, with a head and four uh, legs. Uh, but for instance, we are missing like characteristic features like the ears of the cat that are definitely different than the one of the dog. And then we go to less frequent uh, draws, like for instance that of a bird, and it starts looking like something that still has wings, but it doesn't really look like a bird. And if we ask for a fish, it doesn't look that different anymore than, uh, than actually a bird. So one thing that patients do with semantic variant is they would always, they would tend to use, especially at the early stage of the disease, a word that belongs to the same category, but it's just more frequent. So if you show a picture of a lion, for instance, you may not remember a lion, but you can tell you that it's a cat. Then the disease progressed. They would just, the answer may be just it's an animal. And then the disease progressed, and then at this point there's nothing else that can be uh, linked to that specific image. So I'll show you here an example. So this patient is presented with pictures and is asked to name them. Um, it's some kind of a bed. What do you do with it? Well, it's very well. What's that? I don't know. Do you know what you do with this? Looks like some sort of a, a, a dog. Okay, so once again, when the patient uh, not uses brain to identify the correct name, it's gonna look like in, in this category of animals, but you know, all low frequency animals have disappeared. The snail is probably disappear early, and what's left is a dog. So it's an animal, it gotta be a dog, right? Here an example, instead of a patient's having difficulty with recognizing an object, this is a tennis ball. Oh gosh, oh, oh. Hey, what this is? Hmm. I don't know, I, I don't know what that's called. Uh, what is it? I've, I don't know, that yellow, yellow something or other. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
Don't know? Mm -mm. What do you do with it? Mm -mm. I don't play with that. I'm... Oh. Mm. Oh, I've seen it on, on the floor and really hard, so maybe put down and bring little kids up and mm. play with it. Um, That's is that right. possible? Oh. Okay. So you see the patient again is unsure about what it is. He call it with a color instead than with the proper names. Colors tends to be retained for a longer time in, in this disease. And then another interesting phenomenon for us, you see things get a little bit clearer when she can actually feel it, when she actually touches. So she's using other uh, old memories, let's say, information read. How does that feel? So that feels like a tennis ball. So now that she touch it, the information actually comes back, but she cannot no longer just uh, rely on looking at the image. Of the tennis ball. So this disease is interesting because when it affects the non-language dominant hemisphere, which more often is the right side, so the right temporal pole, they actually present a little bit differently, and it present more similar to a behavioral variant FTD. So behavioral symptoms are a lot more uh, evident if the, the right temporal pole instead of the left is affected. That's just because the symptoms of language are less prevalent. That's the only reason, essentially. So. Um, there are, uh, however, other features. So the temporal pole uh, retain um, semantic information, so the meaning uh, of the information of faces. So this patient sometimes can recognize acquaintances, um, uh, friends, uh, but they have difficulties recognizing a face that is symbolic. So if you show them a picture of Marilyn Monroe, you can say it's a blonde woman, but doesn't know what they represent. The same for Einstein or, or anybody else. So we show them pictures of famous people to understand if they can give us more information than just you know, the image, the, the, the physical detail. What does it represent? Uh, they tend to have an increased interest toward the uh, words and word games. This is probably a release type of phenomenon. So the left temporal lobe, it's now left alone because the right is degenerating. So it cannot do a little overdo. That's what we think may happen. So uh, these people becomes very interested toward games that involves words. They start uh, reading, for instance, obsessively billboards or, uh, um, or uh, car plates. And again, the word search games become very, very significant and sometimes affect many hours of their, of their day. They tend to become rigid in terms of personality, very stick to a very uh, rigid schedule. It is always the same, it should not be uh, disrupted. Again, with a lot of stereotypic behavior and often look cold, distant. Sometimes this can be the very early sign of the disease. It can lead to interpretation like an antisocial type of behavior that can translate into a lot of problems in the work environment, in the family, so raising a lot of issues before that correct diagnosis is actually made. Another feature that we often see in patients with right temporal lobe FTD is hyper-religiosity. So the patient may become much more interested into spirituality. Sometimes they embrace new religions. Sometimes the spirituality is totally new. So in people who never express this feeling uh, before. And it becomes, uh, again, um, overimposing, so pervasive. So it's not just a new interest, okay? But it's something that becomes predominant, the only thing that these people may be interested about during, uh, during their day. Okay, so this is the characteristic feature of semantic variants. So now we're gonna move to the second type of uh, uh, language variant from temporal dementia, so the non-fluent variant. So as the name uh, says, this is a condition in which the most distinctive problem is that of enunciating speech, so actually talking. So being able to uh, translate this idea of words that we have in our mind in uh, a, a word that we can actually tell people. Um, there are always uh, a disruption also of the uh, linguistic rules. So usually there is a profound uh, grammatism, so a lot of grammar mistakes, both in speech and in, and in writing. So uh, lack, for instance, of conjunction or problems with, uh, with the use of verb, for instance, or with the spelling. These are very, very common. Most importantly, again, the speech becomes very effortful, uh, very halting, and there's a lot of sound errors, a lot of distortion that can be perceived uh, uh, very, very easily. Interestingly, the comprehension of, uh, uh, of complex sentences is actually impaired, so it's very difficult for this patient to understand a very long and complex sentence. Though in, uh, in comparison with the semantic variant patients, if we actually give them one word at a time, they will be knowledgeable of all of them. So the knowledge of word is actually fully retained. And so is also the knowledge of object. So I'll show you this woman. And you know, in this first, first part of the video, 
she's going to be asked to uh, reproduce uh, some uh, phonema, so some single sounds. So pa first, then ta, and then ka, and then say those three uh, sounds one after the other. And then she's going to be challenged with a word that's a little bit more complex, like artillery, for instance. And you'll see how uh, this is difficult and, uh, and the changes, the mistakes that she will make that are always different one from another. Pataka, pataka, pataka. So again, she has a full knowledge. She never asked what is that. So while the patient with semantic variant may, uh, but she has this difficulty in enunciation. So again, these are the three prototypical types of frontotemporal dementia. So this is the standard, let's say, like the, the canonical one. Under the umbrella of frontotemporal dementia is either behavioral variant, semantic variant, PPA, or non-fluent variant, PPA. There are, however, uh, at least three more uh, syndromes that we also refer within or under the umbrella of frontotemporal dementia. This is because often in these syndromes, patients will manifest some of the symptoms that we have discussed before, so some behavioral changes, for instance. And also the diseases in the brain that cause these syndromes here are, are shared somewhat by diseases that will cause uh, um, behavioral variant FTD. So this is why these three additional syndromes are placed underneath the same umbrella, okay? So we're now moving from three syndromes to a total of six syndromes, okay? So the first one is frontotemporal dementia with motor neuron disease. Uh, the second one is progressive supranuclear palsy syndrome. And then the last one will be corticobasal syndrome. And again, every time there is the word syndrome, it means the symptoms, okay? Not the disease in the brain. So the first one, frontotemporal dementia with motor neuron Disease. This is one of the most devastating diseases, neurodegenerative diseases that we deal with uh, and patients we have to deal with. Um, motor neuron diseases are diseases that affect the uh, neurons that are somewhat directly or indirectly connected with our muscle. And so um, when they degenerate, they will cause muscle weakness and muscle degeneration. The most common of these diseases is ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig disease because Lou Gehrig was one of the most famous patients affected by this condition. So about 10% of patients with frontotemporal dementia will develop uh, ALS later in the disease course. And most of the patients with ALS uh, develop some type of cognitive impairment. When I say most, I'm referring to more than 50%, it's so about 60%. For some of them, this will uh, turn also into dementia. Sometimes that dementia does not develop because of the relatively shorter duration of uh, survival in patients with ALS, with the average of survival being of only three years. The second of this syndrome is progressive subgranucular palsy syndrome. It's also known as Richardson syndrome. This is a disease that looks a lot like Parkinson's disease, but has some distinctive features that make it noticeable for the clinician relatively early. So these are a, a very early complaints of recurrent falls. So these are usually patients whose very first symptoms is a fall, followed by another fall, and again by another fall. These are usually initially in a one fall every three months, and then become falling once a month, falling once a week, falling several times during, during the week. Falls are usually um, not triggered by, by particular uh, stimulus. So initially, they're, they're attributed to tripping to an object, but in, in, instead it becomes very clear that these are diff problems really with, with balance. There are changes in eye movement that are very typical. Patients are unable to, uh, um, to, um, to move the, their eyes in the, in the for, uh, direct direction of space. This is something that can happen very early in the disease, but sometimes is a little uh, delayed. And it's more severe for movements that are vertical, so vertical high movement are more affected than, uh, than the horizontal movement. 
There is rigidity like in Parkinson, but this tends to be more axial. So instead of being one arm or one leg that is more rigid than the other, which is usually a good sign for Parkinson, meaning this is probably Parkinson, so it can be treated, it will last longer. Patients that tend to be rigid mostly at the level of their skeleton or their neck are more likely to have a progressive supranuclear palsy syndrome, which is a disease that usually had a, uh, uh, a reduced duration and no treatment uh, at this point. So the most distinctive feature is really the lack of responsiveness to levodopa. So even in spite of large doses of levodopa, there is no improvement of the motor uh, symptoms. Cognitively, this patient tends to be mostly disexecutive, so they have difficulties with uh, uh, task solving, task understanding, so um, there is increased uh, impulsivity, and there is a characteristic uh, uh, disruption of the sleep pattern. These patients are unable to reach deepest stage of sleep. It's as if they were in a shallow stage of sleep, essentially, uh, overnight, which makes them also uh, less cognitively performant. The last of the syndrome is corticobasal syndrome. So this is a condition, again, also similar to Parkinson. It's uh, similar to Parkinson in the sense that it is uh, often asymmetric, so the manifestations actually are more obvious on one side, either the left or the right of, of the body. And, uh, but the, the features are different than, than Parkinson's. So there is rigidity, but there's also dystonia. Dystonia is an abnormal uh, muscle tone regulation that involves the tone of more than one muscle. So uh, a series of muscles usually that regulate the position of a specific joint in space. So it can be the, the, the wrist, for instance, it can be at the finger, it can be the arm at different positions from the shoulder to the elbow down. So the patient will tend to acquire a position uh, of, of their arm that is abnormal. Sometimes it's closer to their chest or, or not functional. There is usually myoclonus, which is the presence of jerky involuntary movements. They may be either spontaneous or sometimes uh, triggered by, for instance, uh, uh, tactile stimulation. Patients develop incoordination of movement that involves both the mouth, so the oral apraxia, and the limbs, so the arm. So if they have to reach for an object, for instance, they overshoot, or they will be unable to, uh, um, to execute a series of actions that is the proper for the goal that they are trying to achieve. There are other features that basically tell us that there are other parts of the brain involved. We call them cortical sensory deficits. Among those, essentially, there is asterognosis, which is the inability to recognize an object just from touching it, even though without looking at it. We're all able to say this is probably a cell phone or this is a key, uh, but this is an ability to get lost, that they disappear very early in patients with CBS. The same thing, patients are unable, for instance, to tell what type of numbers or letter we are pretending to write on their, on their palm. So this ability to see with eyes closed, essentially, just uh, relying on sensation is lost early in the disease. And then there is a strange phenomenon, it's called the alien limb phenomenon. As you can see, it's basically a phenomenon by which the uh, limbs, usually an, an end or, or an arm, starts moving on its own. So while the patient is not planning to execute that action, an action, for instance, like arm levitation, uh, the arm does levitate while the patient is doing something completely different. Sometimes the inner limb phenomenon is oppositional, meaning the arm that is affected may try to oppose the function of the other one. Sometimes the other one is actually the good one, meaning the, the one where like movement is still retained and but uh, is um, uh, unable to actually execute correct movement because of the alien limb phenomenon from the other side. So I'll show you a, a, a video. This is a patient with a corticobasal syndrome who also has non-fluent variant PPA. So you will see uh, movement abnormalities while a language is tested. So you will recognize the deficit of non-fluent variant PPA. In, uh, uh, in the background, you will also see the movement uh, disorder uh, uh, related to corticobasal syndrome. Artillery. Could you say five times for me? Artillery, mm -hmm. artillery. Artillery, uh, artillery, um, artillery, um. So you can see that the right uh, uh, arm is held on a dystonic posture. You can see the, the position of the arm overall. Position of the finger, the wrist is not 
normal, is, is, not, is not natural. And then the left arm is moving a lot, and you will see that actually at some point it will start doing things that are actually not in the volition of the patient and are positive toward the right side. Great, well done. Should we try another one? Impossibility. Very difficult one. Impossibility. You see the end going all the way that side to the left. Okay. Should we try another one? Now Catastrophe. So that's why alien limb, because it's really like an art, an arm really that move on its own, almost as a mind of, of its own. So, so we have now uh, seen all the six uh, cardinal syndromes that are under the umbrella of frontotemporal dementia. So in this slide that you've seen before, uh, you have on top the six uh, different clinical syndromes within the spectrum of frontotemporal dementia. So behavioral variant FTD semantic variant, PPA, non-fluent variant, PPA, and then frontotemporal dementia with motor neuron disease, the ALS uh, type, corticobasal syndrome, this last one that uh, we saw, and progressive supranuclear pulse. You may remember the one with severe high movement abnormalities. So in the lower portion of the slide instead, we'll see the causes of this syndrome. So this is what we actually see in the brain. So what is in the brain that is causing the symptoms up here. And the slide is color coded in a way that based on the color, you can see how frequent is that that syndrome is linked to each and every one of this uh, uh, pathology. So these are all distant processes that can happen in the brain. Each one of these is a distant thing, a distant entity that can be seen by the neuropathologist under the microscope, and it can cause one of this uh, syndrome. So for instance, if you look at semantic variant PPA, you can trace that semantic variant PPA is most commonly caused by a single pathology, that is for the temporal lobe degeneration with TDP43, this is the name of this protein, and the type C actually, so not the other ones, but mostly the type C. You can also see that progressive supernova palsy syndrome is almost always caused by PSP pathology. So again, this is the syndrome, but can also be caused by other conditions like corticobasal degeneration or PIC. But the majority of cases of PSP syndrome will actually have PSP uh, pathology. You can see that why in some cases this association is almost one-to-one. Uh, -one. For instance, if a patient has motor neuron disease, is probably going to have like a 95 to 99% of the times is going to have TDP43 pathology in the brain. So for some of this uh, clinical pathological correlation, the correspondence is actually pretty strong. So a neurologist can guess uh, in, a, in, a, in a very educated way what the neuropathologist is going to find eventually at autopsy. This is important because in the end, when we use medication both to treat this condition or to prevent this condition, we actually need to know what's happening in the brain, regardless of what the symptoms are. So the symptoms are useful just to recognize the process that is happening in the brain. But the, our ultimate goal in clinic or also for clinical trial purposes is actually to understand what's happening in the brain. Is this a dysfunction of tau or is this a dysfunction of TDP? Because this will be very different, so we will have to treat them very differently. So you see that while for some of these conditions, this association is almost one-to-one, -one, here, here, and here, for other conditions, and BVFTD, the behavioral variant FTD syndrome is probably the worst, this association is extremely difficult. So almost all of these conditions underneath, or these pathological changes in the brain, can cause behavioral variant FTD. And it gets even worse, because if we add Alzheimer's disease to this picture, as you already know from the lecture of Dr. Nassan, Alzheimer's disease can also cause frontotemporal dementia type of clinical manifestation. So explain about a third of all cases of corticobasal syndrome. So if patients are very young, for instance, and they have corticobasal syndrome, they often tend to have Alzheimer's instead of corticobasal degeneration. It can also cause some cases of semantic variant PPA, and it can even cause some cases of behavioral variant FTD, frontotemporal dementia. Again, in the lecture of Dr. Nassan, you saw so-called frontal variant of Alzheimer's disease. So it gets very complicated. So I'm going to show you uh, how these pathologists look at the microscope uh, 
briefly, but just to give a sense also of historically how we ended up uh, here. So we're going to start from the uh, group of the FTLD tau. We call the disease tauopathies, so basically disease linked to tau. You see the peak is one of them, but only one of them. There are many others. So uh, up to the beginning of the century, we actually thought that frontotemporal uh, uh, dementia, frontotemporal lobe degeneration in, in tau were somewhat synonymous, so that almost always all the FTD uh, cases were due to tau deposition, though some of these cases behave differently than expected under the microscope. We actually learned only recently, so uh, starting from 2006 when TDP-43 was discovered, that the tauopathies are not the majority of frontotemporal lobe degeneration, but they represent only up to 40% of cases. So then they are divided in terms of uh, uh, the pathology based on how they look under the microscope. So these are the peak bodies that Arnold Pick saw already uh, um, uh, at the beginning of the last century. They look the same even today with stain with tau. This is a tufted astrocyte. So these are the inclusion of tau protein within the most proximal process of astrocytes. So not neuron, but astrocytes, other cells that are in the brain. So when a neuropathologist see this, he knows that this was a case of progressive organogal palsy, even pathologically. And this is an astrocytic plaque. Looks similar to the neuritic plaques that you've seen for Alzheimer's, but it's very different. Again, here again, the deposits are in astrocytes and not in neuron. And this time is also the distal processes of the astrocyte that are involved by the deposition. So we move now to the FDLD TDP. So again, TDP43 was only discovered in 2006, but we now know that 55% of cases of FDLD are caused by the deposition of this protein. And you know, since you can, since now we now know that it's really you know what parts of the brain are eventually affected by the deposition of this protein, as opposed to creating this one-to-one -one association syndrome versus pathology, you can tell that the name has changed, right? So before we had progressive supernuclear palsy pathologically, just because it's the most common problem happening in the brain in patients with progressive supernuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration a lot of patients with cortical basal syndrome. So now that we understand that it doesn't really matter, it depends on what part of the brain are affected by this condition, the classification of TDP-43 pathology is much more simple and less exciting, right? It's just type A, type B, type C, type T, so we no longer associate a specific uh, name. But again, this looked different at the microscope. So in type A, you see that these short neurites and also the presence of uh, uh, inclusions in, both in the cytoplasm of neurons and sometimes in the nuclei. In type B, these inclusions are very speckled, fainted, granular. Usually the nucleus of the neuron that is affected doesn't have normal TDP staining. These are lower motor neurons like in ALS. So this is the appearance of motor neurons that are degenerating and they will cause eventually muscle weakness and muscle waste. This is probably the most useful for us. So when a, a neuropathologist see this figure, so the presence of this very long dystrophic neurite staining with TDP43 has a 95, 99% or probably more chance that this was a case of semantic variant PPA. This is very the strongest one, one to one. So as a neuropathologist, I almost don't need to know what was the story of this patient to guess that this was semantic variant, because that's what this figure will eventually be associated with in terms of clinical presentation. And then there is a very rare type D, which is associated with a genetic condition that also affect the bones and the muscle, but it's much rarer. We don't have any case actually in our brain bank here in San Francisco. Finally, the last group, the fasopathies. These are the, the, uh, the one that I write the, the last. It's less than 5% of cases of FTLD. Some of these forms are genetics, and when they're genetics, they also cause uh, motor neuron, uh, so ALS symptoms, motor neuron degeneration. Uh, some cases are sporadic instead. Uh, the presentation is that of behavioral variant FTD, but usually with the very early age at onset. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk now briefly about this last two points of my talk. So one is again the neurodegeneration of aging, so this very latest uh, finding, and late is actually the name that, uh, that received and what is the meaning uh, for dementia in the elderly. And then the chronic traumatic encephalopathy.
So remember we talked about this TDP43, the 55% of all cases of FTLD, right, of frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Well, it turned out that after we found this protein and we uh, learned how to stain, how to look for that in brain tissue, TDP43 is actually a lot more common and can be seen even in cases that have not frontotemporal lobar degeneration, but can have any other disease, like Alzheimer's, for instance, or Lewy body disease, or even not having any of those. This is why we call this disorder limbic predominant age-related TDP43 encephalopathy, or late. Again, this paper was published just on April 30th. So when this happened, basically, there is deposition of TDP43 in structures that are uh, limbic, in the limbic structures of the brain, essentially in the hippocampus, uh, in the single gyrus, in the amygdala, so in structures that are also heavily affected in, in Alzheimer's uh, disease. And we found it up in 25% of uh, cases in autopsy series. So these are the regions, again, of the brain that are affected by this relatively new condition. Again, we've known about this now for a while, but we now put it together only recently. So again, the hippocampus, the temporal lobe of the brain. So structures of the brain that are usually very affected and early affected in Alzheimer's disease. You can see that the, from, from this graph that the prevalence of this uh, condition of late in the brain just increased with age. So you see it's about 10% less than 75 years old, but it get uh, much more prevalent, up to 70% in individuals that are very old. Why is this important? Because we believe it could be the only cause of dementia in individuals who actually do not have Alzheimer's but really look a lot like they do have it. That's one thing. This is the case, for instance, of an 86 year old woman who had progressive problems with memory, amnestic dementia, but had biomarkers negative for amyloid and, and also for tau. So she doesn't have Alzheimer's disease, though she really looks like. She has this new condition late that really causes a similar type of presentation. And it's also important for patients who do have Alzheimer's disease or other conditions, because, for instance, in the presence of late, on top of Alzheimer's disease, they actually undergo a much more severe degeneration of the brains, a much more severe atrophy of the hippocampus, which can translate, for instance, into a faster progression of the disease, a faster decline of cognitive uh, performance. So this raises one of the final questions of uh, today's talk. So is dementia caused by one or multiple diseases of the brain? And the answer is that this is actually, uh, is probably caused by the co-presence, the coexistence of multiple diseases. So this is a, uh, a study done in a, a you know, community dwelling courts of patients in Brazil and led by Lea Greenberg, who is a collaborator here at UCSF, that shows that, uh, as you can see, uh, it's very common that you can find not just a single disease, but eventually two or three or four and even more in the presence of more conditions in the same brain of a person with dementia tends to increase, the number tends to increase with the, the increase in age. So similar concepts were actually uh, uh, presented also by another group, that of uh, Virginia Lee and John Trojanowski in, a, in another a paper just a few months ago. So to give you just a, uh, an example, so this is, for instance, Alzheimer's disease cases. So you see all cases with Alzheimer's disease, 100% of them have tau deposition and also beta amyloid. But you see that 41% to 55% of cases also do have alpha-synuclein. Uh, 33 to 40% of cases also will have uh, a TDP43 pathology. And the same is true for each and every one of the other categories of diseases that we taught today. So for instance, uh, in tauopathies here, 100% of them have tau, but it also tends to have alpha-synuclein in a proportion that varies, 7 to 22 percent, and also tends to have late, 24 percent, for instance, in CBD, or 16 percent in PSP. The same in TDP43 pathology, the, the same in alpha-synuclein pathology. So while there may be a, a main, a predominant disease that drives the clinical presentation, there are actually more than one disease in the brain uh, that is occurring at the same time. This is something that we need to keep in mind when we treat, uh, when we treat patients. So some patients may respond better than others. Or maybe in order to prevent dementia, we have to treat more than one disease at the same time. So this table, for instance, tells us in a study done at Rush University on a research participant who later developed cognitive impairment and underwent autopsy, an estimate of what was causing the dementia, what was contributing to the dementia. 
So according to this study, to this report, only 40% of the cognitive symptoms were attributable to Alzheimer's disease. But the remaining 25% that were attributed to the vascular changes. So these are important to know because these are things that we can change. So at this moment, we almost have nothing to prevent neurodegenerative diseases, perhaps with the exception of physical exercise and social engagement. But we do have a lot to protect ourselves from this 24%. If we keep our blood pressure below a certain limit, if we avoid diabetes, hyperlipidema, if we do exercise a lot, if we don't smoke. Late, it plays a very important role that is almost up to 20%. It could even be higher than, than, than what we know. And then there's also the alpha synuclein which role is probably half of that for late. Finally, uh, what's, the, what's chronic traumatic encephalopathy? So you might have heard about this condition as the condition of the NFL player. So this is a disease that seems to be very high in prevalence in people who have been exposed professionally to contact sports and have had a lot of uh, 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 traumas, so repeated, repeated concussion. It's a disease that's caused by accumulation of tau uh, protein in the brain. So, but what are the real numbers? So, uh, a recent study from Anne Mackey has shown that this condition is present in almost everyone who has been like an NFL player, just regardless of the development of cognitive syndrome, so 99%. And that the highest risk factor is indeed the presence of multiple repeated head trauma. The disease can present essentially in two ways, either behave, as a behavioral syndrome with increased irritability, explosive, aggressive behavior sometimes, profound depression that often leads to suicide. This is actually how the disease became uh, actually under, investi as under investigation in the NFL court. But very often, it can also present late in life as a memory disease, as a memory problem. So an amnestic syndrome this is essentially indistinguishable from Alzheimer's disease. So if a patient comes to clinic and has a history of a head trauma, very often they say, is it possible that that trauma is now causing chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Is it possible that because of that motor vehicle accident, that fall that I had, for instance, 40 years ago, I'm now developing CTE instead of Alzheimer's disease, even though things look alike? Well, the answer is that if you have a history of contact sport participation, and this doesn't matter whether it is professional or not, then you have probably a risk of having CT in one out of three people who have that history of repeated trauma. The counterpart, however, is that if there is no history of repeated uh, concussion, repeated head trauma, not only sports, but also, for instance, exposure to blast, this is important for our veterans. So if there's not uh, uh, that history, the presence of this condition is almost zero. So it almost doesn't exist. So it's even in patients who actually do have a history of a significant head trauma. So a single significant head trauma is a risk, is a risk factor for developing, a de uh, de uh, developing dementia later, is a risk factor also for Alzheimer's disease, but it's not directly associated, as we know now, with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. For that, you need multiple, hundreds, thousands of repeated uh, events that occur like uh, for many years. So I'm finally to the, to the last uh, slide. So uh, Alzheimer's disease is indeed the most common form uh, uh, of uh, um, cause of dementia throughout the lifespan, but it's not the only one. Frontotemporal dementias are as common as AD in people who are 65 and more common than AD in people who are younger than 60. So they need to be recognized. They also affect people at the, um, a time in their life when they still may be very active, and so there is a much uh, larger set of implications. In older adults, dementia is very unlikely to be caused by a single neuropathological process. The rule is actually is that very often we find more than one diseases, and the number of diseases increase as older the patient, uh, uh, the patient gets. So the likelihood of developing a syndrome is really uh, linked to that number. And finally, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a, uh, is a new condition, but this is very important for people who are exposed to repetitive trauma especially contact sports, again, and, and blast, but it's unlikely to represent like a serious threat for people who have been exposed to single head trauma uh, in life. All right, thank you so much for your attention. Great, well, thank you so much, that was amazing. I think you've had the most comprehensive overview of the neurodegenerative diseases. So far, counting the whole three lectures, I think this finalizes the
the more scientifically based sessions. The next sessions will be around uh, prevention strategies, treatment, and then uh, the final uh, lecture on uh, giving you a, a bigger picture view of the impact of these diseases, not only in San Francisco and the Bay Area, but throughout the world. Um, we have time for a few questions. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is a great question. So in this very long lecture, but I was asked to talk about everything else. <laughs> uh, so we're supposed to end actually talking about prions. So prion uh, diseases are a relatively rare condition compared to these ones that, that we discussed, but they do exist. And so, and they're caused basically by these proteins, similar to the one that we talk here, that have this ability to uh, self-replicate. So imagine that there is a protein that is normal in the brain. All of a sudden, it changed shape, you acquire the new shape that is pathologic, meaning it will cause neuronal loss. But not only that, it starts forcing all the other protein uh, similar to do this very same thing. So you kind of copped this mechanism that eventually spread. So this is how prion diseases were, uh, were discovered, and again, they're rare. However, we've found out recently, in the recent years, that uh, these proteins associated with Alzheimer's disease, but also with frontotemporal lobe degeneration and Lewy body disease, do behave similarly to prion diseases. And this is the most interesting features that basically has been uh, approved in this recent paper. So this happened to be the case for both beta amyloid and, and tau. There is a lot of interest because the propensity of this protein to actually cause problems seems to be stronger when we tested uh, the uh, uh, tissue samples obtained from younger patients as opposed to that for patients uh, that develop their symptoms later on. So there's a lot to learn about what this really uh, means. This doesn't mean that these diseases are at this moment seen as contagious. Uh, but, it, uh, but it basically teaches some basic mechanism that can explain why some people live very, uh, very long, survive very long with these conditions, and others instead have a very fast type of uh, progression, which is similar to what we see in prion diseases. Yes, question in the back. Yeah. Is uh, both uh, beta amyloid and the tau protein, are those both present with TBI? So, uh, so they do, uh, but it, we have to distinguish yeah the TBI from the from the CT. That's just because we talked about CT tonight. So, in chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, tau deposits alone are sufficient to cause the disease. And this patient with CT uh, who don't have any amyloid at all, zero. Uh, in traumatic brain injury, so for instance, if a patient has a significant trauma from a motor vehicle accident, for instance, or, or other sorts of, uh, of uh, cause or trigger, then there is actually a, a transient accumulation of uh, uh, beta amyloid, mostly in the white matter, so in, in the long tract, that is more indicative of the trauma itself. But it does not lead to the, uh, at least as far as we know, to the classic uh, development of Alzheimer's disease. Having said that, though, having a history of a head trauma increased the risk for neurodegenerative diseases later in life. But not for CT, but the whole the all group uh, of diseases. I, I want to make a comment uh, that I think is important from your talk that you illustrated very nicely. I hope everybody appreciates that. You know, this process that we clinicians go through when we're trying to, when we're seeing patients, trying to, you know, bring up, con conjure in our minds signs and symptoms, clinical syndromes, and then try to bring it down to the underlying pathology, as you can see, is very complex. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is why for us clinicians, it's always a better idea to see patients early than late in their disease. And uh, because we, we can more clearly understand what is happening, where in the brain is happening. And as Dr. Spina alluded to uh, moments ago, this is gonna be important in the future because the, the disease modifying therapies that we're all working on will be targeting those underlying proteins. I mean, that's the model that we're, we're working on right now. And you'll hear more about that in a subsequent lecture. So um, very important to think of early, early detection. Yes. Uh, clearly, access to tissue samples is extremely important for successful research. You talk a little bit about how the research community as a whole collects and perhaps even shares uh, brain tissue samples. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, it is extremely important. So most of the... Uh, 
the knowledge that we have about these diseases, uh, we have it thanks to the uh, generous donation of patients, of research participants, who's ultimate, really, generous gesture to us that are donating their brain. And it's uh, there where we find uh, the, the response, so the answers for, for what basically caused the disease, and also how we learn, really, the, the mechanism of the generation. A lot of this, uh, this, con of this uh, uh, development in science has really been driven by neuropathology. So, for instance, all those cases of frontotemporal dementia that did not stain for tau had to be something else. And it wasn't until we found the P43 that then we learn instead that you know, this type of degeneration is actually more common, one thing. Second thing, for instance, is linked to ALS. This has caused joining forces. So behavioral neurologists treating dementia and neuromuscular disease experts very often didn't talk for quite some time. Then we realized, wait a minute, we are treating the same disease, just looking at a different, a different aspect. So there is, there's a lot of initiative um, internationally and, and nationwide, the National Alzheimer's Disease Coordination Center, the NAC Center, is the uh, central repository for, um, for neuropathology, for all the neuropathology data. Uh, the majority of Alzheimer's disease research centers, including ours, uh, are involved in uh, uh, collection of, of brain samples, and many of them, though not all of them, have a neurodegenerative uh, disease brain bank, like the one that we have. So uh, the, the tissue is available for uh, investigators uh, uh, to, to study just upon request. All we need to know is that they're going to make a good use of, uh, of that. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, given the symptom, symptoms for the various diseases should be difficult to distinguish, are you making use of any of the AI diagnostic tools to sort of help you decide what particular variation of a brain disease you're looking at? That's a great question. Uh, not at our center, um, but I'm sure somebody's thinking of it. I mean, more broadly for medicine in general, that's a, a hot topic for sure. How, how do we use AI to better diagnose, to be more precise about diagnoses, uh, interpreting data? But not in our center. I don't think anyone is. Yeah, so for, for clinical purposes, we're not there yet. But that's probably going to be the future. But uh, in terms of research, there is a lot of interest toward that. So there's uh, several collaborators uh, in, uh, in our group at the Memory and Aging Center that are actually trying to do this. So in using different type of approaches, sometimes a completely uh, a prioristic and biased approach, meaning you, know, you present a computer like uh, 10,000 scans, and you ask them to classify them according to disease. The machine, surprisingly, does a very good job. But of course, I mean, very often it will tell us just one disease, for instance. So you will not have those nuances of looking at, OK, what else is beyond the first, uh, um, uh, the first disease that is causing the, the symptoms. So yeah, I think those approaches will become a lot more popular uh, in the future. And very, very soon, they will translate also into clinical practice, I think. However, you know, our, our visits with patients are usually very long. So so our a new patient visit sometimes varies from a standard two hours to a lot more. And that's because it takes a lot to elicit those, those symptoms. Sometimes you can have a conversation that lasts like an hour and a half until you run into an asparagus and a patient who say, what is an asparagus? <laughs> so it, it, it requires a, a lot of, of patience. And uh, um, I don't think that we will ever have a world that, that will be like clinician free or free from, from the direct contact. Really, most of the diagnoses are, uh, are done by, um, by the patient the way he presents, interacts with us, and a lot, a lot by their families and their caregivers. We'll pick each and every one of these nuances. We just need to remember and have the time, basically, to check all the marks. So that's, that's why the visit tends to be very long. Thank you.